welcome back everybody uh, we have been discussing on the basics of uh, pathogenesis of diseases today we will be concluding this part uh, just uh, by discussing on the basis of bacterial and uh, viral pathogenesis the pathogenesis of infections with uh, fungal protozoan and prion diseases are essentially same but uh, bacterial uh, pathogenesis involves a uh, use of diverse uh, mechanisms to uh, establish the organism to invade the host and all whereas uh, virus uses uh, the same sequences but their tools for invading are quite different so today we will be focusing on uh, bacterial and viral pathogenesis and concluding the topic of uh, pathogenesis of infections in this session so we have been discussing about the preliminaries of uh, uh, or the basic ideas regarding pathogenesis of infection how uh, the initial uh, portal of entry uh, is established or a beachhead of infection is established what are what is the need for colonization of an organism in this initial beachhead and how they spread along the various uh, or in uh, invade into the um, or breach their primary uh, targets and uh, reach into the lymphatics and uh, uses the lymphatics and circulatory system to spread into various organisms organs and uh, establish an infection uh, in the host now today we will be first we will come to bacterial pathogenesis so uh, bacterial pathogenesis is quite interesting because bacteria use a uh, wide variety of uh, various uh, techniques to get into the host because of its large genome it can produce many many things inside their host uh, inside their cell also and also secrete many things outside uh, the cell into the host and cause various problems in the uh, host and uh, ex uh, result in various uh, host and pathogen interactions so what are the initial uh, methods or how do bacteria interact with the host so bacteria interact with their host by colonization and uh, from after colonization uh, or the process of colonization initially involves adhesion onto the uh, target uh, cell or substances then multiplication and establishing the primary colony then invasion by breaching into the um, uh, or breaching the primary lines of uh, defenses and further evading the immune responses from the host and they ex uh, exert damage onto the cell uh, either by killing the cell or rendering the cell uh, uh, incapable of uh, processing or de degrading the invading pathogen by method of toxin production so these uh, mechanisms involve various uh, genetic apparatuses uh, or various apparatus are used by the bacteria to do all these things and uh, you know it will be different for different uh, bacterial species and many a times it is different for the same species uh, uh, or different strains of the same species and these factors that help in the colonization production of toxin or survival in the host is called as virulence factors and virulence factors may be coded by more than one gene and they are usually glycoprotein in nature or uh, lipid in nature and uh, these um, mechanisms are used for uh, the survival of the organisms in their host and it is different for different type of bacteria and uh, this difference in between the bacteria as well as the bet uh, between the strains of different bacteria within the same species uh, will give different pathogenicity profile for different organisms that are uh, causing the infection and uh, the, that is known as the pathogenicity profile and it can be acquired from other bacteria uh, by horizontal gene transfer like uh, through conjugation or transduction or uh, using a, uh, or a transformation and all or uh, it can be through plasmids and uh, certain uh, either it can uh, so it can be through plasmids or the gene can be integrated into the whole uh, the, the basic genome of the bacteria and those are known as pathogenicity islands so plasmids are extra nuclear 
uh, circular DNA present inside the bacteria that can work independently and secrete these virulence factors or uh, sometimes the bacteria acquire these genes as a separate cassette and it is inserted into the whole genome and those uh, uh, se sections of gene are known as pathogenicity islands. So th that is how these bacteria acquire different types of virulence factors and as I told you they are uh, basically glycoproteins or lipid in nature and they can be toxins that can uh, you know kill the phagocytic cells or uh, exotoxins or endotoxins we will be coming to that uh, in detail later so exotoxin is produced by gram positive bacteria endotoxin by gram negative bacteria but we will be dealing all this uh, in detail and uh, it can uh, it can stop uh, phagocytosis once it, uh, the, the, the bacteria is internalized, uh, so it can be uh, by prevention of opsonization, can be prevention of phagolysosome formation or it can be by production of large amount of uh, antioxidants or even by using uh, the, the, the virulence factor can be a capsule. So virulence factor, uh, virulence gene in the bacteria acts, uh, acts by capsule production. So the, the, that is how the organism, the, the invading organism interact with the pathogen. Now let us see how this pathogenesis happens. So before uh, going into much details, uh, we will see the chronology of colonization of the bacteria. Once colonization happens then further, uh, further mechanisms will be different for different organisms that we are not going to discuss here. So initially there will be ad adhesion followed by colonization then there will be toxigenesis and uh, after toxigenesis the organism invades into the uh, into the host tissues. So, how does adhesion happen? Adhesion means attachment of the bacteria onto the uh, specific epithelial uh, cells and uh, it, it, it uses uh, many, many uh, systems. It can be by production of certain proteins called as adhesins which will help the bacteria to adhere onto the surface of the cell. Can be through the uh, use of pili. Uh, or fimbriae uh, and uh, they, these will be helping in the uh, attachment of the bacteria onto the surface of the cell. Uh, then uh, you have colonization. So colonization means the adherence and the multiplication of bacteria in the initial site of encounter. Uh, it can be using invasins or spreading factors. So these can be uh, chemicals such as uh, or enzymes such as hyaluronidase collagenase, kinase, lecithinase and certain proteins called invasive proteins. So for example, in case of uh, Clostridium shavoi, it produces lecithinase and uh, that causes the um, or that punctures holes inside the or on the surface of cell causing cell, uh, cell leakage. Similarly, invasins are another group of uh, chemicals uh, secreted for example by Listeria monocytogenes once they are in uh, the, the they are secreted uh, the uh, invasion will help in internalizing the bacteria into the cells uh, of the host then so that is uh, uh, you know invasion as a part of colonization then they can even uh, once they are into or penetrate the epithelial uh, um, uh, epithelial cells as I we have seen in the last class there are about five or seven methods so once they get into the cell following initial encounter they can use the same uh, mechanisms to lyse the tissue or the extracellular membrane and thus help further spreading then bacteria uses toxins to damage these cells and later on results in full blown full blown invasion onto the host tissues so what are the bacterial or wha how, what are importance or um, importance of toxins for a bacteria? So the toxins help in functioning by killing cells, by destroying the extracellular matrix or inducing apoptosis of the uh, cells. Uh, now toxins are of uh, various uh, types and broadly they are classified based on the bacteria that produces the toxin. So toxins have multiple functions and they are produced by um, or they are classified based on the type of that bacteria that produces this toxin. So to, uh, the, the toxin produced by a live gram positive bacteria is called as an exotoxin. Uh, 
So, uh, yes, we will be coming to this later. So, bacteria toxin produced by a live uh, gram positive bacteria is called as an exotoxin. And uh, when uh, lipoticoic acids are certain types of toxins that is released into the environment when this gram positive bacteria dies. Similarly, gram negative bacteria have endotoxins on their periplasmic. Uh, area and uh, when these bacteria die they release this endotoxin so the toxin is not secreted and uh, or produced and secreted outside uh, as in case of exotoxin but it is kept inside the body of the bacteria that is why it is called as an endotoxin then uh, when it comes to the exotoxin of bacteria again we have a large diversity of uh, exotoxins mm, they can be either uh, directly acting and cause uh, causing cytolysis then there is another group of bacterial exotoxin called as ab toxin so these ab toxins are uh, double chained toxins so they have two chains uh, essentially peptide in nature and they have two chains a small chain and a large chain and uh, so b or the smaller chain uh, or one of the chain acts as the receptor for or, or uh, uh, act as a ligand for the uh, receptor and this receptor will be specific to the cells and uh, this B chain will help in attaching and delivering the A chain which is the toxin that will go into or that is inserted into the cell and causing um, tissue damage. So, the, the, since it is a, a receptor ligand uh, interaction is involved these toxins are more tissue specific. For example, tetanus toxin is specific to the neuronal tissues it is because all, almost all these clostridial organism will have this ab type of uh, toxin or their toxin will be to, uh, they, they will have two chain, uh, two chains peptide in nature they will be having two chains and uh, one will be a receptor and the other will be doing the problems then there are certain toxins that are surface acting sur example are uh, super antigens uh, for example, the vacuolating uh, toxin of Helicobacter pylori, so pylori uh, these toxins will act on the surface of cell causing cell uh, lysis or uh, lysis of the uh, cell membrane uh, like uh, the alpha toxin of uh, Staphylococcus aureus. So those are exotoxins, then we have lipoticoic acids and endotoxins. Then another group of toxins are called as siderophores. So siderophore means iron binding. Now, the importance of this uh, siderophores are that this uh, toxin or these proteins scavenges the iron, free iron or bound iron from the host cell and it is given to the bacteria because bacteria need iron, uh, it's, it's an essential component for bacterial replication. So, iron is uh, very much needed for bacteria and uh, siderophores will scavenge the iron from the host tissue and deliver into the, into the bacteria. Then we have secretion systems. So, secretion system is another uh, set of uh, toxin production system. Um, it is very important in case of glanders. So, there are about uh, uh, one uh, or not about there are uh, six types of secretion system uh, named at, uh, secre uh, secretion uh, system type 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. Uh, so, it is known as um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 and uh, uh, these secretion systems uh, are or uh, the system is used to inject the toxin into the cell. So, the bacteria will attach and inject the toxin into the host cell and once this toxin is ingest, injected to the host cell, it will enter and uh, damage the cell signaling system of the host and thus it will lyse the or kill the bacterial cell. Then uh, there is uh, biofilm formation. Uh, so, biofilm formation is very important in diseases like uh, mastitis or very chronic diseases like mastitis, where the bacteria, uh, once you have a group of bacteria, uh, so the bacteria will recognize the minimum number of, if the minimum number of organisms are present, it is known as bacterial quorum sensing. So, uh, if they, they, they have a minimum set of bacteria in a particular tissue, they will start producing and releasing uh, certain um, chemicals like mucopolysaccharides into the matrix. And these organisms or this bacterial organism will embed itself in this matrix and this is known as biofilms. <clears throat> so, biofilm offer 
a greater deal of protection so instead of working as individual single celled organism the bacteria work as a social community so it is that the, the microbiology turns from individual microbiology to a socio microbiology and uh, naturally since it, it works as a very large macroscopic organism um, it uh, the and it is embedded in the, the, the pathogenic organism is embedded into this uh, uh, so called matrix uh you, the antibiotics will not be able to reach or the ph ph phagocytic uh, system will not be able to reach and uh, it will be able to survive <coughs> inside the host so biofilms are another mechanism or a so called toxin or a virulence factor when it comes to bacterial pathogenesis then we have capsules so capsules are very important as you know in case of most of this back gram negative bacteria have a capsule then capsules of anthrax bacillus is very famous or rather notorious and uh, they, they help in um, both adhesion as well as prevention of phagocytosis. Uh, so th that is how the bacterial colonization happens. So before colonization there should be an initial encounter and usually mucus is the initial site of encounter. I will just uh, tell about the use of how, how bacteria uses the mucus and uh, finish off this uh, topic. So mucus um, is very important because mucus is uh, produced or the evolutionary importance of mucus or how it helps in survival of the organism is because mucus works as a protective cover of otherwise very vulnerable epithelium. But invading bacteria what they use is that they use mucus in many forms. As I told you in case of certain organisms um, the mucus works as a very strong chemo attractant for many of these organisms like certain spirochetes. So, um, it the mu the presence of mucus is sensed by this organism and many a times they use uh, this mucus as a carbon source for energy. Then uh, the organism coats itself in, in the mucus and uh, that may help in pro uh, escaping phagocytosis. Similarly, the, the medium, the mucus media is utilized by certain path, uh, motile pathogens and it is used to work as a medium to reach this. Uh, epithelial cells and uh, of course the uh, cells that does not have a mucus is uh, like our M cells uh, if you remember in the last class M cells of uh, uh, always gives a very uh, peculiar opportunity for invasion and pathogenesis. So that is the relevance of mucus and that is how this organism enter and invade the, uh, in the host. So we know that we have various treatment or bacterial disease are amenable to treatment and we have been using antibiotics to treat bacterial infections since the discovery of penicillin. But uh, you know it is always an evolutionary arms race. So uh, we are uh, using antibiotics, antibiotics naturally put a selection pressure in the bacteria and the bacteria uh, will have to evolve. Uh, it is quite natural that these bacteria evolve uh, many ways. So that the menace of antibiotics to the bacteria is uh, uh, is overcome, uh, and that has resulted to a more serious uh, problems in public health called as antibiotic resistance. So when we come to when we discuss about uh, pathogenesis of uh, bacterial infection, it is prudent that we have a general idea on how antibiotic resistance works. So uh, antibiotic resistance stability of the bacteria to you know to overcome the effect of antibiotic or you know the bacteriostatic or seedal activity overcome the static or seedal activity of uh, the antibiotics or antimicrobials that are used in treatment. So let us see how this antibiotic resistance works. Uh, essentially it is a mechanism uh, it works in one of the four ways. Uh, one is the use of uh, degrading enzymes. So degrading enzymes, uh, for example, uh, it will be beta lactamase, where beta lactam uh, antibiotics are degraded by the beta lactamase uh, present in the bacteria. Example is uh, uh, the beta lactamase present in Klebsiella pneumonia, Salmonella typhimurium, Staph aureus, and all. Then another um, mechanism is to, uh, you know, they uh, once antibiotics gets into the cell the cell will produce certain chemicals that will be binding to this antibiotic and it will change the 
binding site of these enzymes. Essentially, these antibiotics are inhibitors of many enzymes that are needed for functioning of the bacteria. And uh, what these uh, altering enzymes or altering uh, chemicals do is that they will change the shape of the, uh, the, the incoming antibiotic so that it cannot bind it to the uh, needed receptors. So, example is penicillin binding proteins that are present in um, methicillin resistant uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Another mechanism to overcome resistance is the to is that the bacteria may find an alternate pathway which bypasses the pathway that uh, the antibiotic is blocking. Well, typical example will be is, uh, the use of folic acid and the sulfonamide. So, if you give sulfonamide, uh, sulfonamides will inhibit the uh, inhibit the uh, formation of uh, uh, folic acid or uh, tetrahydro uh, uh, formation of folic acid from PABA. So, what will the bacteria do? Bacteria will not be able, once you have uh, sulfonamide in the environment, bacteria will not be able to utilize PABA. So, what will they do is that they shut down that system and switch over to a system where it can directly utilize folic acid for further downstream processing. So, that is why we need, we have to do a sequential blockade using um, yeah, four amino pyramids. So, that is how uh, uh, the bacteria alters its um, uh, metabolic pathways. Then third is the more interesting thing called as efflux pumps. So, efflux pumps are uh, nothing. So, the antibiotic will be coming into the bacterial uh, cytoplasm. Once the bacteria senses that uh, this is an antibiotic, bacteria will open the efflux pump. So, what will it will do? Antibiotic will be coming into in through one side and efflux pump will function and efflux pump will push out the antibiotics from the cell to the exterior environment. Very uh, typical example is efflux pumps uh, that operate in case of um, uh, fluoroquinolone resistant bacteria. So, they, they simply you know um, push out the antibiotic back into the environment so that the bacterial cell will remain free from the antibiotic. So, that is the mechanism of antibiotic resistance and that is how bacterial infections exert their or bacterial organisms exert their pathogenesis. Now, let us see the viral pathogenesis. <coughs> so, what are the important uh, features of viral pathogens as compared to bacterial pathogenesis? So, by now you know that uh, bacterial organisms are very uh, uh, have a very elaborate system of um, production of toxins, virulence factors, biofilms and all to evade the immune response and all. But uh, when you consider a virus, it is like one hundredth of a bacteria maybe. And it has a very limited set of genes. So, the even though they produce certain virulence factors, the diversity and mechanisms of the, the bacteria is no comparison or uh, the, the viral mechanisms is out of comparison when you when it comes to bacteria. So, they have very very simple mechanisms, they have very limited number of things. So, they can only if, uh, exert a very very few things to for its survival and this virus does not need anything. They it is not even uh, we are not even sure if it is a live thing or not. But and uh, it, it simply has to get into the cell, replicate and come out. By that time, it causes damage. That is a different thing. But the, the mechanisms are very, very simple when it com comes to viral infections. So, virus, uh, let us see what are the mechanisms there. So, the, the most important thing for a virus is to have a target cell. So, there should be a target cell and uh, it cannot go and attach to any cell it wants or uh, uh, it, it it binds only through a ligand receptor setup only. So, the bacteria, oh sorry, the virus will have certain ligands uh, which will uh, be uh, binding to a certain types of uh, receptor proteins on the surface of the uh, host organism. So, if the or virus is able to bind only to one type of surface, then <laughs> the the uh, the lesions or the pathogenesis will be specific to that particular organism. For example, in our novel coronavirus, the, the current novel coronavirus, it will bind only to ACE2 receptor and only the cells that has this particular ACE2 receptor will be infected by the virus. It will not affect any other cells that does not have the receptor. 
So that means it will bind, it, it will produce only a tissue specific infection. For some, some organism, some um, uh, virus have a uh, receptor or have a ligand that will attach to a wider variety or they will have a group of receptors that can attach to a wider variety of receptors and uh, that the, m one or more of these receptors may be present in all over the body and if the condition is like that then these viruses can produce a multi or can, they, these viruses are known as pantropic viruses and can produce pantropic infections like in canine distemper like in canine distemper and uh, this presence of target cell again determines the route of infection in case of viruses for example if the in case of ibr the target cell is present on the uh, respiratory epithelium only so uh, the the and this uh, uh, receptors are present on the apical and the lateral surface of the respiratory epithelium so the organism enters once the organism enters through the respiratory system it goes and binds to receptor enters into the cell and produces pathogenesis so that will help in virus attachment but when you consider parvoviral enteritis so we know that the parvovirus multiplies on the uh, rapidly dividing cells in the crypts of the intestine but the receptors are present on the basal and lateral surface of the intestine and it is not present on the apical surface or it is not exposed to the um, intestinal epithelial mucosal surface so if a parvovirus comes all the way down to the intestine so that it can multiply on intestine it is not possible for the organism because receptors are not exposed so what is the mechanism of pathogenesis the pathogenesis happens when the organism in is ingested or inhaled the first site of colonization is the pharyngeal tonsils and from pharyngeal tonsils it is internalized by dendritic cells or uh, lymphocytes or the phagocytic system and through leukocyte trafficking it is taken into the uh, into the uh, lymph nodes and through lymphatics it will have to reach the uh, intestinal uh, tissues or uh, cells having the uh, where the cells are having receptors and from there it will produce the or it will attach on to the receptors on the basal so it will go from um, down under or through the hematogenous spread it will only it will reach not through the gastrointestinal tract then it will start uh, producing so why does this organism take this tortuous course then or rather than simply going down all the way through the uh, gastrointestinal tract because this mechanism will help the virus in protecting itself from the pH uh, the, the changes in the pH in the gastrointestinal tract and the, the gastric acids in the stomach so the receptors the presence of receptor and location and distribution of receptor will determine how the infection is acquired or the 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 route of infection uh, by the or route of infection that is to be taken by the virus then there is a concept of permissiveness of a host cell so permissiveness means the uh, if the receptors are present simply means if the receptors for the virus is present on the surface of the host cell so if a cell is permissive that means it will allow the virus to enter into the cell and replicate so that the virus replicates and comes out of the cell so a permissive cell will ultimately die of virus infection but if the cell is non permissive then the virus cannot get into the cell or it cannot replicate for example in case of uh, visna medi virus uh, the lymphoblasts are non permissive virus may be entering but it is not non permissive that means the virus will not be able to multiply once the cell matures to a lymphocyte or a bone marrow cell what will happen is that uh, it becomes suddenly permissive and that will result in replication of the virus so that is permissiveness then what will happen once a virus infection happens once a virus infection and replication happens there are four uh, possibilities first is lysis or the, the virus will lyse the cell and come out or it will the virus may induce apoptosis of the cell so that the cell dies virus may remain in the cell without any damage onto the cell that is known as a latency or persistence then the, the virus can induce the 
cell to proliferate or it can induce malignancy. So that are the changes that happen to the target cell. Now what is the replication cycle of a virus? So, uh, there is a chronology of uh, virus replication involved. First the virus will attach as uh, the, the captured or enveloped protein will be there and it will help in the attachment of the virus. Then the virus will enter via phagocytosis or endocytosis and release the contents into the cytosome. Then there will be a spread of virus in the cell wherein the nucleic acid is moved to the specific location where viral replication or the transcription or translation happens. Then there will be replication. Replication means the proteins uh, needed for viral coat, uh, uh, virus and the nucleic acid is continually synthesized in the cell and the virus escapes the cell by usually by lysis or by budding off from the cell. Now the pathogenicity of the virus is you know reflected by the influence of this virus on the uh, functions of the organelles and how these um, virus escape from these target cells. So let us see how the virus replicates inside the uh, host uh, cell. So we know that there are two types of virus basically that is the DNA virus and RNA virus and they use two different mechanisms you can say three different mechanisms and uh, for DNA virus it enters, uh, uncoats itself, releases the DNA, DNA is taken into the nucleus and uh, where it uh, transcribes and uh, produces mRNA produces uh, uh, you know uh, translates or produces structural and functional proteins needed so uh, then once the sufficient proteins are produced then it undergoes transcription to produce viral dna everything undergoes assembly and it is released into the cell now it's quite straightforward thing rna virus can either do this in a straightforward manner as some of these virus may have an rna dependent rna polymerase which will produce both the proteins so the RNA can function as mRNA or the RNA can be uh, you know a copy of RNA can be made in the antisense uh, way so that a positive sense mRNA is produced and proteins are produced yeah, but essentially there should, there will be an uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase and this RNA polymerase will produce RNA copies of RNA from the RNA and it is uh, released uh, or uh, you know you get the viral RNA you get the viral protein and finally it goes for the assembly and release or certain RNA virus or the so called retroviruses will have another type of protein called as the reverse transcriptase which will convert RNA to DNA or called as a proviral DNA and it is inserted into the nucleus of the host and uh, then this uh, you know uh, this DNA produces further mRNA and causes production of proteins and further transcribes the RNA and this RNA and the proteins produced assemble and the cell is released into the or the virus is released into the extracellular matrix or whatever the environment it is in. So that is how viral replication happens inside the cell and this method of replication also determines the pathogenicity of the virus. And when it comes to the release of virus into the uh, or outside the cell it can be again of uh, two ways so for enveloped virus uh, or for non enveloped virus if the virus does not have an envelope once the nucleic acid and the capsids uh, assemble uh, the virus progeny are released on mass into the cell by the lysis into the neighboring cells or tissues by lysis of the cell but in case of uh, enveloped virus it is a bit more complicated because they will have to uh, take on the envelope which is actually a part of the uh, host's uh, plasma membrane or, uh, or the host cell membrane and uh, uh, this uh, is done by the process uh, of budding. So following the assembly the capsid and the, uh, the assembly of nucleic acid and the capsid the, the assembled material is pushed on to the uh, cell's cytocavitary system or that is the uh, the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi complex and it is uh, the virus is moved into a place uh, designated place where it is to be uh, pushed out of the cell and uh, then as the <coughs> virus moves the glycoprotein 
um, on the envelopes are being attached as it go moves through the cytocavitary system and finally the um, uh, it is moved to the budding site the virus is moved to the budding site and released but there is a so when the uh, it is released from the cytoplasm it is not necessary that the host cell dies except in case of herpes virus where budding occurs from the nuclear membrane so from the nuclear membrane site uh, the virus is uh, released into the cytosol and again the virus will have to rupture the cell and release itself in case of herpes virus so that is one peculiar uh, feature of herpes virus then what are the virulence factors when it comes to viruses so as we as i told earlier uh, the 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 uh, viral um, factors are or the viral um, uh, genome is very limited and it does not have uh, the vast diversity of virulence factors that you see in case of um, our bacterial uh, pathogens so when it comes to the virulence factors of virus it is always expression of the genes that produce uh, proteins and the that determines and these proteins will help in the determinants of pathogenesis but uh, the proteins uh, are more involved in the attachment replication and the shedding of the virus and uh, sometimes it helps in evading the immunity also so so there are very rare cases where certain byproducts of the virus act as toxins to the cell for example capsaicin like uh, protein in canine corona virus uh, what happens is that as the virus is released into the cell this capsaicin like protein is released and it uh, goes and by, uh, enters into the cell that is not infected with the virus and this cell will uh, uh, there will be changes in the permeability and the cell leaking happens and that induces the diarrhea in case of uh, canine corona virus infections in canine corona it is actually an enteritic uh, form of infection or the the uh, signs are uh, diarrhea and uh, diarrhea rather than respiratory as we are seeing now in novel coronavirus anyways then uh, you should know about the possibilities of uh, genome change in viruses uh, as i told earlier it virus is a very simple uh, structure it just has it has just its nuclear material and uh, captured and sometimes enveloped so whatever virulence factor happens or whatever virulence or pathogenesis is attributed to a virus it is always because of the set of the few set of genes that is possessed by this virus so there are uh, certain types of um, you know uh, genetic modifications that happen in the virus uh, for bacteria it is you know as you know it is um, conjugation transduction transformation etc for virus there are uh, you know uh, this is very important the genomic changes will depend upon the type of the nuclear material so dna replication in itself it has a proofreading assembly and uh, there won't be much change from one viral progeny to other in case of dna virus but rna virus rna replication it is important that it does not have a proofreading mechanism that means rna viruses are very prone to mutations and uh, changes in its genome every time it gets replicated so this um, rapid changes in every progeny or a very very frequent accumulation of changes is actually a very big evolutionary advantage for the virus because it may acquire new target sites because the proteins that are modified uh, present on the surface may get modified so these viruses uh, or rna virus are very prone to mutation that means they are very prone to produce newer diseases so that is the advantage then how does these changes happen uh, one uh, set of changes very uh, to, uh, actually this will be very familiar to you those are antigenic shift and antigenic drift and recombination so what is antigenic drift antigenic drift means as i told you it happens in rna virus there will be small mutations every time the virus replicates and this sometimes what happens is that these point mutation will change cause some minor change in the surface of the protein so you may get a new protein on the surface for example in influenza virus antigenic shift to make uh, sorry antigenic drift to make cause uh, production of a newer type of uh, hemagglutinin or a newer type of neuraminidase so that is antigenic drift and uh, thus you get a newer protein with a newer uh, or which can have a 
you know it uh, a change in the actual original uh, site of attachment and that is known as antigenic drift so what will happen the animal or the virus may get a newer target cell that is known as antigenic drift so here uh, only the the original gene was there and there is a small mutation in the original gene now then we have antigenic shift antigenic shift happens in rna viruses that have different segments of so the virus should have segmented nucleic acid okay for example influenza virus again they have a certain sets of or it has a segmented nucleic acid i think it is about eight uh, segments are there of varying in length and each of these segment can function independently of the other segment so it is quite like our chromosomes or a chromosome of a eukaryote okay now what happens imagine a cell which is infected by two types of influenza virus you know there are multiple h7 n7 h1 n5 h3 n5 so there are multiple types but certain cells are permissive to multiple strains of this virus or oh, those cells or those animals are known as mixing vessel typical example is pig so pigs what happens the pig may be infected with an avian strain of influenza virus and a human strain of influenza virus both may be one may be a highly pathogenic avian influenza and then the other may be a normal or flu virus or a, a, a low pathogenic uh, uh, human influenza virus now what happens pig is permeable uh, or pig cells are the respiratory epithelium of the pig are permeable permissive to both of these what happens simultaneously there will be a infection of both of these viruses now what will happen now when the virus assembles there is every chance that some of the genes from the avian strain may get included into the human strain or vice versa or in any other combination now what will be the new product form new product formed will be a totally different virus which has the characters of both of these virus sometimes what will happen it will have the receptors for human cells and it will be carrying the genes that are highly pathogenic or uh, the genes from the highly pathogenic avian influenza uh, from the avian uh, this thing it will result in a virus that will have that has the ability to attach to human cell and they are highly pathogenic so there is a huge so totally a new different type of virus is found from co infection with the two previously known existing virus so there is a, 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 a total shift in the antigenic pattern of the virus that is why it is called as antigenic shift so what will happen so that will end, end up in mixing up of rna segments and a immunologically unique protein is developed on the surface of the virus so that the, it becomes a novel virus that is known as antigenic shift now there is recombination <coughs> or reassortment reassortment happens when either a part of the the whole the original genome is deleted added or a uh, new set of genes is uh, acquired from an external environment again what will happen there may be two totally different species of virus they may mix in the same uh, organism and will produce a totally new virus that is known as antigenic or uh, the viral resortment so these are the three factors that will cause a total shift or a total change in the pathogenicity of the virus so that is how virus survives changes its pathogenic profile and replicate inside a host cell now when it comes to the protozoan or fungal infection also i am not explaining much because basically and essentially it is all the the method of pathogenesis or the starting up of pathogenesis is quite the same and uh, further details again it is not possible because of the vastness of topic so we will be focus uh, uh, learning about pathogenesis of individual disease in a separate manner so that finishes the uh, basics of, uh, regarding the pathogenesis of infectious diseases thank you